I'm very, very happy to, to welcome Zach Coleman. I'm sure he's going, there's going to be a lot of fun <laughs> during his talk. And okay, yeah, give him some encouragement. Okay, so I'm wearing my spiffy new Railsberry t-shirt, which means basically that this talk is going to be engaging and interesting. And if you don't believe that, I think it means you hate Railsberry and maybe Krakow. So does anybody hate any of those things? We're going to do well together. I'm excited. So I have a bit of a confession to make first. Um, everyone on the stage is going to lie to you. I have a different confession to make. That was kind of a lie. But here's what I'm thinking about this. I've thought about this a lot, and everyone who is, goes on stage or who writes a blog post or is in a position to tell you about something is inherently going to rely upon their own experiences to tell you that. For example, let's say I'm in a consultancy, and I use Cucumber a lot, and Cucumber is awesome because it's really good for like client work and all of that sort of stuff. And I tell you, Cucumber is amazing. But inherently, it's amazing to me because that works for me. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently of like, man, it would be great if we could say something that like, if you add a cucumber to a project, it would make your project so much better without opinion, with more science and stats behind it. So I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Let me tell you another story. About a year ago, I was out to dinner with a friend and we had a really long, deep dinner time conversation about uh, evolution of Ruby syntax over the years. Uh, we have really boring dinner time conversations. Uh, the waitress probably thought we were insane. But we were talking about this, and I was telling my friend that I, I've been using the stats library, and let me blow your minds for a second. Stats hasn't really changed much. Calculating the mean is going to be the same for quite some time. So I was using this Ruby library from 10, 15 years ago, and it was working fine. But then I had to go look at the code, and the code looked like a war zone. Like, it didn't even look like Ruby. It had like 40, 50 line methods, no tests, classes and modules all in the same file. And it made me start to think like, how has Ruby changed over time? Is how we're writing Ruby different? And we started talking about this and we're figuring out like, well, maybe Rails was a big deal. Even for people who don't write Rails, maybe Rails, the mere fact that it existed and it became so opinionated and popular, changed how we wrote Ruby. And I think it would be kind of fascinating to figure out how we can see how Ruby itself has changed. And is it changing more in the future? So, that's sort of been what I've been thinking about the last few years. Uh, I, I think about weird things. But that's what I want to talk about today, is aggressively probing Ruby projects. Uh, I'm Zach Holman, a Holman on GitHub, Holman on Twitter. Uh, I work at this darling of a company. Uh, I guess we're paying for beers tonight, so I don't know if you guys drink, but... Uh, I'm just kidding, I found out that you guys drink. Jeez. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about a couple of different things. First, I want to talk about the methodology. I wrote code that describes Ruby, when you get down to it. And this could very clearly be a horrible, completely terrible, worthless of an idea, or the most fundamentally changing thing in computer science of all time. And I'll accept nothing in between the two. So we're going to figure out together what it is. Uh, to begin with, uh, I index a bunch of code. Um, and then I analyze a bunch of code. That's what it does. It's pretty simple. A little bit more details. One, I look at your repository, then I run some probes on it, and then I report on it. So by looking at your repository, I mean I clone your repository locally, and then I look at it. Easy enough. Two, probe analysis. Probe is just a, a definition in my project. A um, bunch of different files where we just run tests against your code. Um, and then we run a report on it using fancy schmancy graphics and stuff. Um, so that's easy. Repository, probes, reports. Uh, the difference is that we do this a whole bunch of different times. So right now, over just the last week or so, uh, I've run against 15,000 repositories, which may seem like a lot. It, it's really not. It's really tiny. Um, but the idea is that we get a lot more over time. Um, and then we run it against uh, 41 different tests and 17 different files. Um, things like lines of code written, number of commits, uh, other interesting things, which I'll get into. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we run a bunch of reports on it. Um, and we don't report on the head of your repo, we report on 10 slices of your repository. Um, to detail that a little bit more, we just take all the shells in your project, flatten it out, and then split it into 10 equidistant parts. Uh, that's not based on time, that's based on proportion of commits over time to your repository. 
Um, so this means we can run all of these separate reports 10 times against your repository so you can see how your uh, repository has changed over time. Maybe you write more tests at the end of your repository's life cycle because you're lazy like the rest of us. Uh, we can start figuring this stuff out like that. So if you do the math between all of these things, it's something like 80 trillion metrics I'm tracking or, or something. I'm actually not sure. It's closer to like 6.5 million at this point and that's going to grow dramatically over time. Um, but this is cool. This is a lot of data that uh, not a lot of people have tapped into before and I'm hoping that it will end up getting us a lot of really interesting things to say about Ruby. Um, so the goal is to index all of these different projects, see how they change over time, and compare them against every other index project out there. So you can gain some insights about your own projects and see how that has changed, and then how you compare to everyone else. So like every good statistician, there are some caveats to this approach. Um, I don't want to burst your bubble, but this guy is not a statistician. Uh, he's barely a programmer. Um, so be wary of some of the stuff I'm going to say today, but it is open source, so if you are a statistician, uh, you can put me to shame and send a pull request and I will gratefully accept it. Um, secondly, it's GitHub only. Uh, as a GitHub employee, I'm contractually obligated to only use GitHub products first, which is kind of limited, but I'm just fucking with you. Uh, <laughs> I use GitHub only because our API is actually pretty decent. And from the start, I wanted to index stuff like RubyForge and RubyGems itself because those attack a lot of projects that uh, got developed before the existence of GitHub. And I want to start looking at stuff from the late 90s, the mid 90s, and see how Ruby has really changed dramatically over time. Um, but just to start out, it's sort of GitHub only because the API is nice in there. If you've ever, ever looked at the Ruby Forge API, uh, that's interesting. Um, this also means that it's newer projects. And I'm not saying newer on GitHub, I'm saying newer projects. Uh, the only ones that are older than GitHub's lifetime on GitHub are probably the ones that have a life outside of GitHub. They're very popular projects, they're very old and want to go for the collaboration parts. But I think in general, this means that we're only gonna select projects that tend to be uh, uh, newer. and That may impact how people code. Um, beyond that, uh, I started out indexing only the popular projects, which ends up being kind of cool because then we can take a snapshot of what do the popular projects do off the top and how can you sort of adjust your own project to match the things that these popular projects have done. Um, and then only public code. Uh, this is not just from the GitHub perspective, because I'm definitely not going to touch any of your private repositories, but I'm also talking about on your VPS, on your server, that Ruby script you have lying around. I'm not going to hack into your web server to check it out, which seems kind of silly, uh, but the big deal is that there's a lot of Ruby code out there that isn't indexable, which is kind of a bummer, um, but that just doesn't index it. So in general, this is a new project. I think it's fun. I think it's fascinating. I think there's some really cool stuff to be pulled out of this. Take it lightly for now. But I think uh, the main reason why I'm doing this is that I think it can be very interesting down the line for sure. Um, otherwise, everything else is going to be 100% accurate, and there will be no flame wars over any of this. Um, so act accordingly. Uh, so I want to talk about Hopper. Hopper is the main project that all of this is. Does everybody know this guy? It's Dennis Hopper. If you don't, I, I'm so disappointed in you. Blue Velvet, Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now, he's in a speed, right? Speed. Um, so yeah, this is not open source until I'm done with my talk, and then it'll be open source. i keep you in suspense until I open source it. Um, but that's what it looks like. Uh, I've spent very little time on the front end because almost everything is based on the data uh, underneath it. Um, but eventually there's gonna be lots of different D3 graphs and stuff. If you played around with D3, it's actually pretty rad. Um, but I want to talk more about the underlying substance of it so far. Um, these are all the characters that make up Hopper so far. Uh, Sinatra Redis, Heroku Rescue, Ruby 1.9, and LibGit 2. I want to talk a little bit about how stuff is built because I find it fascinating. I also wanted to say, I mean, I know a lot of these people personally, um, no one dresses like Frank Sinatra anymore. And it's kind of disappointing. Like, look at how charming that guy is. <laughs> Anyway, so Sinatra, uh, I realize I'm advocating the use of Sinatra at Railsbury. Um, deal with it. Uh, I, I like Sinatra because it's, for this project, it's a very simple UI. It's very easy to get your head around, so you don't need a lot of overhead on top of that. Uh, it uses PJAX, which is really cool, way to do client-side um, AJAX very simply. Um, minimal front end, it uses mustache, SCSS, and CoffeeScript. Uh, SCSS and CoffeeScript is sort of the, the standard we use at GitHub nowadays, and I really dig it. Um, I don't use JavaScript anymore, really, because that's uncouth. Um, Redis, uh, Redis is the entire data store for this, which is kind of fun. Um, mostly because this is primarily a schemaless uh, 
problem I'm dealing with. I have a lot of different probes and they all handle different data. And to do that in a structured database is a little bit more difficult than I wanted to, uh, to deal with right away. Um, most because all the probes are dynamic, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but it means that I don't have to deal with figuring out how to persist the data. I just have to set up my methods in a correct way, and then it just lets uh, Hopper do all the rest. Um, also, easy bootstrapping. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the ass to install databases. And I know that's probably a weird thing to say, but like installing is always a kind of a pain. Redis is a lot easier to install, and there's no migrations and stuff, uh, which, again, may seem kind of silly to a room full of technical people, but you want to do stuff that is very simple and easy to pull down your project and get going right away. And I think this really matches that. Um, it also uses Redis to go. Are there Redis to go guys in here? I've been told. There we go. Uh, I love you guys because uh, it turns out this generates a lot of data. And I blew through the, the freebie Heroku limits for a while pretty quickly and then stepped up a couple plans. Anyway, I talked to them and they were like, yeah, what do you need? I will give you all of the space in the world. So they gave me all the space in the world and now I'm using it. Uh, sorry for the rest of you who want to use space. Um, I also use Heroku, you guys probably all know about this, easy deployment, Cedar Stack is rad if you haven't used this yet. Uh, all of the worker processes and stuff is really cool, you can kind of do whatever you want, um, which definitely wasn't the case prior. Um, and I use this a lot because I use Rescue to handle all the, the indexing jobs, and I use independent workers and I run millions of jobs through it um, pretty quickly. And they can all act on their own repository and deal with it and churn through it all and then I can just set it and forget it and just scale up, you know, as I go. Um, also, I wanted to talk about Ruby 1.9 because this started out as a 1.8 project. Um, and then I realized, like, stop hurting us. Like, if you're not using 1.9, you're kind of part of the problem right now. And I kind of hate you because 1.9 is kind of awesome. Um, and there's some real reasons why I used 1.9 for this. Uh, does anybody use Ripper at all in 1.9? Uh, yeah, you have, you're, Sven up here is like the only one who has ever written about Ripper online, and it's kind of amazing. Um, so maybe I'll write about that separately, but basically it's a way to easily uh, parse out the AST of the Ruby code that you're looking at. And I use this to check out um, different things about uh, the structure of your app, like your classes and modules defined, your methods, stuff like that. It's a lot easier than dealing with a hairy mess of regexes or anything like that. Um, so this is really cool. This happened to me a lot quicker than the, the route I was doing on 1.8 with uh, Ruby Parser. Um, and this has been really awesome. Um, I just really want to briefly touch on libgit2, um, which is uh, really awesome. I use Rugged, which is uh, back in the libgit2. Libgit2 is basically a linkable Git library, which is in a whole bunch of different languages now, and it's a, really, excuse me, it's a really fast way to uh, dive into everything you possibly want to get. Um, fast and easy, I'll talk about this very shortly. Um, but first, just overall probing. This is sort of the, the main center of everything that happens in Hopper. Um, and the main driver behind all of this is I wanted new probes to be easy to write. Because um, I'm definitely not going to write all of them, because there's a lot of things you can figure out about what makes a project really good. What can I analyze about your code that makes it interesting to see? And I want this to be a very clean, easy way for people new to my open source project to write it. Um, so this is a slimmed down version of the probe. Uh, everything inherits from probe, which gives you a lot of cool functionality and stuff. Uh, for example, you basically define which method you're going to use to calculate. Uh, in this case, we're calculating the number of lines of code in a particular project. All you have to do is define, like, expose as lines, and that will handle all your data persistence for you. You don't have to deal with saving to Redis, because if you accept people's open source contributions, they'll probably screw it up. Uh, try to do things as easy as possible for your new people. Um, we also have a concept of repository in this. Um, that accesses your repository. But basically all you have to do is do like repository.files, that gives you all the, or the files in your repository at that specific revision, because again we're doing snapshots uh, 10 different times of that repository, and then you just read the file and then sum it up. You just return that uh, integer and then we'll handle the rest. Then it runs all the calculations and averages and means, which I'll get into shortly. Um, briefly I want to talk about the repository, there's a bunch of convenience methods, helper methods to help you actually do the nitty gritty of reading all of these different lines and revisions and stuff like that. Um, ideally, I want to abstract this out to Subversion, Mercurial, all of that fun stuff, because I think it's really interesting to try and figure out um, to go beyond just GitHub, obviously. Um, and a quick aside, Rugged is really awesome. Um, so if you're like me, you have like about a million one-off Ruby scripts that all shell out to Git. 
shelling out is super slow, especially in this, where we're doing it uh, a couple million times. Um, so using Rugged is just require it, and then you can uh, send it a path. It'll look into that repository. Uh, and in this example, you can just look up a particular SHA, and it'll return a message. Um, you can also traverse the, the, the different trees inside of your Git repository, which is kind of fun. Um, in this case, you just push a SHA into the stack, and then you can map out all the IDs that, for that particular tree. Um, you can also writer stage new commits faster than shelling out, of course. Uh, it's actually faster than any other Git library, which is kind of rad. Um, so if you want to do anything really fast, it's multi-platform, permissive license, gem install rugged, it's fun. Um, okay, science. I want to start to talk about a little bit about the results um, from some of the stuff I've been indexing. Uh, this is sort of just touching the, the, the tip of the iceberg, um, but there is some interesting stuff I found out already. So, if you're like me, you don't remember anything about stats. Very basically, I just want to tell you that the mean is 2.8 in this slew of numbers. Uh, median is the, uh, the midpoint if you align them all up, and the mode is the number of times, uh, the, the, the instance of the, the number that you're looking at that occurs the most. Do we have that basic stats remembrance remembered? All right. Uh, so I indexed 15,698 projects so far. Um, and I think that's a good number to start out with. Again, this is the, the most popular 15,000 projects on GitHub. If you just sort by a number of forks, uh, that's what it is. So it gives us sort of a good perspective on how, uh, how those projects are built. And most projects are lonely. You probably all know this. So when you push that really good thing out to the world and no one cares about it except for you, and maybe that your mom or something, she checks your GitHub feed. <laughs> Yeah, mom, I'm learning about concurrency today, because Jose told me to. Please fork me. Um, <laughs> that's the last forking joke I'll make. Uh, so this is the mean out of all that. The average contributor is 3.77. But the difference is, is that, as you see, it, popular projects are really popular. And most projects are not. If you look at the median, uh, a good number is about two. Per, for the first 15,000 repositories, it's two contributors who actually help out with you, which is kind of sad. Like, we want more and more. We think open source is some really you know, egalitarian, awesome society, but popular projects get a disproportionate amount of help, um, which sort of makes sense, but it's kind of cool to see the numbers behind that. Um, most have 22 followers uh, for each uh, repo watchers in GitHub parlance, um, and most have about five forks. Uh, five forks for two contributors mean about three inactive or ignored forks. I think part of that is the problem of people forking your repository and then forgetting about it. I don't know why they do that. They're kind of assholes. Uh, <laughs> but it's kind of interesting to see how people actually deal with the social structure of all these repositories. Uh, again, this doesn't take into account the bottom 90%. Open source is a long, long, lonely tale. Most of the, 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 the top projects get all of the attention. So number two, offensive Ruby code is offensive. Um, so, I don't know if you know this, I sometimes will like to swear, because I find it interesting. Uh, sort of you do too. About half a swear word in each, fi uh, in each project. It's probably like pho or sh. But probably more offensively, there's about 4.27 defined methods per project if you're really hated against metaprogramming. It's about 30, 30 cents. Uh, but that's a little bit harder to measure because some people name their methods send, uh, which is kind of silly. Um, but that's kind of interesting. Uh, I have a big question for you, though. Possibly the biggest question of all time. Do you hard tab or soft tab? I don't care because I already know the answer. You are a horrible person if you hard tab. You're ruining everything. Luckily, only about 8% of projects predominantly tab, where that is the main, uh, or hard tab, where is that, that is the main tabbing mechanism for their projects. Um, we should find these people and shoot them. <laughs> but equally as heinous is adding trailing spaces to your files. Just, ugh, it messes everything up. Uh, most have about 31 trailing spaces. If you look at the average, it's like 531. So maybe popular projects like to trail their spaces a lot. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, also, I looked into uh, your JavaScript directories and Rails projects. 98% of Rails projects avoid semicolons in JavaScript. <laughs> I'm just kidding. For the love of God, stop talking about semicolons. They're so boring. Okay. 
Okay, the work. Uh, so this is sort of the, the standard Ruby project. About four and a half hundred, who says that? 4,500 lines of Ruby code, 700 and some commit lines, 17,000 total lines of code. That's the mean. Again, uh, popular projects are gonna bring these numbers way up uh, because they tend to be bigger, more popular, stuff like that. If you look at the median, which is sometimes a better indicator of this sort of stuff, uh, it's about 500 lines of Ruby code, much more manageable, much smaller and only about 60 some commented lines, which is kind of depressing. Um, but overall leans to about 1,000 total lines. That also includes README, different files in your uh, project, licenses, stuff like that. Uh, but from this you can see that popular projects tend to have more non-Ruby code, and inline documentation is sparse. I would rather see that be about 200,000% because I love documentation, but that's just me. Um, moving on, I mean, there's about two-ish branches uh, on average per project um, on GitHub where you can actually check to see how many branches they push to GitHub. Uh, the median again is one, so I think people tend to just do their one master branch and say, that's fine, I'm just gonna ship it. Uh, if you look at things like Rails uh, and just bigger projects, they have lots more branches, which I think makes sense because they have to deal with contributors a lot. Um, total commits of 400, again 110 for the median, it comes down a lot more once you analyze more and more projects as they get newer and newer, uh, kind of fascinating. One of the big things about Hopper is I wanted to s specifically study Ruby. Um, and there have been a few different code indexing projects in general who try to an analyze you know, number of lines of code or number of commits, but I wanted to see specifically uh, Ruby particular parts of the ecosystem because that's what I'm interested in. Um, it was kind of surprising to find that 78% of projects have a rake file. Um, that thing just keeps on ticking. Like, Rake is actually a pretty solid project, and it's used a lot. Um, more surprising, I thought, Bundler came in with 31% had a gem file. Which you think, if you think that Bundler is, what, two or three years old at this point, uh, that's not bad penetration for being um, a somewhat new project. It's sort of become a staple for a lot of different things. Um, if you're interested in other stuff, 15% have a gem file that lock. Um, have or have not read Yehuda's post about it, I don't know. Uh, and then 51% of projects had a gem spec. So there's a lot of gems being pushed to GitHub, but there's also a lot of projects that don't have a gem spec. Maybe they're Ruby projects, maybe they're just crazy. I just want to look at containers, because I kind of find this kind of fascinating. Uh, if you look at the numbers between uh, how many classes you have in a particular project, how many modules you have in a particular project. This also includes redefinitions, so if you declare module, whatever, inside your project again, it's gonna show up again. But as you can see again, this is sort of uh, skews towards the more popular projects. They have a lot more classes and modules, and the regular project tends to be a lot smaller. Um, same thing with methods. Uh, Rubyists tend to favor instance methods, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, take it as you will. And then finally, uh, Number five, the paperwork. 47% uh, of projects don't have a license, uh, which is terrible. Um, I don't know how the rest of the world works. I just know America's crazy, ridiculous everything. But by default, um, code is copyrighted um, by, by the essence of you making it. So if you push something to GitHub, we have something in our terms of service that basically means people can fork and stuff from it. But this presents a big barrier to a lot of big companies who say you cannot use a project unless it has a nice open source license or a open source license. Um, and that's actually a big deal. I don't think there's enough uh, uh, stress placed on this, that it should be more important to put licenses in as much things as possible. Um, across all projects, including those that didn't have licenses, 44% chose MIT, uh, and then 2.2 Apache, 1.1 GPL, and half for LGPL. Uh, I, I will make no statements based on these numbers because license flame wars are, fuck that. Uh, and then briefly, just wanted to talk about the future a little bit. Um, this has been kind of a fun last month or two of me building this, but there's still a sh crap ton of stuff I want to build out. Um, one is arbitrary comparisons. I want to compare things arbitrarily against any other metric. This is sort of the goldmine of things that um, you can look at particular popular projects and say, what makes those really popular? Um, and I think we need to sort of re-architecture some of the data, unfortunately, to deal with this really easily, but I think this is sort of the, the really fun stuff we can do. Um, secondly, multiple languages, I think is a no-brainer. Uh, it's sort of built to do that from the, the ground up, but I wanted to start out with Ruby, because that's what I know, and that's sort of what I'm interested in. 
But I think ideally it would be fun to do multiple languages so you can compare against languages. Um, we tend to know that Rubyus probably opt towards CoffeeScript more than other people. Um, but it would be nice to get some actual science beyond that. It would be cool to see different uh, islands of people together and see how people band together and what is actually more closer to being alike, what they value, than they may otherwise think. Um, and then I just want to play with D3 some more. I don't know if you guys played with D3. It kind of destroys my brain a little bit, but it's kind of fun. It gets nice little charts and stuff. Um, I was trying to do a bunch of different uh, charts and stuff in Keynote for you guys. Turns out Keynote does not like uh, multiple thousands of data points, uh, which is depressing, and I was going to put it in Excel, and then I didn't want to do that, so I didn't. Uh, but I think D3 can really churn through a bunch of that stuff really well. So, um, that's my thing. Hopper's going to be hosted on code stat. I think I'm going to call it code stat. It can also be code status. I was really clever with the URL. Code stat.us, which is not up yet. GitHub.com slash Holman slash Hopper will be the open source project. I'm going to turn both of these on as soon as I'm done with my talk so you can check them out and abuse the horribly underpowered site that it's running on. Um, and then check it out for yourself. Because I think this is really going to be interesting once we sort of get everyone working on this and try and build something that could be really interesting for everyone else to analyze languages, syntax, um, whatever. Because I mean, this is our language, this is Ruby, and I think the more we know about it, the more we can figure out where it's going and figure out where we came from. So, that's my spiel. Uh, have you got any of those numbers, like, see how they change over the time? Um, not yet. Uh, part of the, the... Some insights, maybe? Um, not yet. Uh, part of the cool thing I wanted to do is um, attack the UI a lot more. Um, basically, I want a huge slider. So if you look on the individual project view, um, which there is an individual project view, um, I want to basically take every metric and then just slide throughout time so you can see how things tend to change over time. Um, I think that'd be really fascinating to see, one, how projects get built, because I think people have a, a, an emphasis in the beginning of the project versus the end of the project. Um, and I think that'd be kind of fascinating. So that's sort of the next step. Thanks. Hey, I have a question. Uh, Mike, so you said that thing about the license, which is, in fact, very worrisome. Uh, since you work at GitHub, maybe you can answer whether GitHub plans to add some kind of mechanism for requiring or assisting people to add licenses to their projects. That's a good idea. <laughs> We've talked about that a lot. We'll put it that way. Do you perhaps have any stats on the size of a class and average size of a method? So these are kind of code quality stuff. stuff yeah. Like um, so I had a few things about that uh, early on. I actually had Flog and Flay both uh, in Hopper and then I had lots of problems with them. They seg faulted a lot. Um, but I think it would be really interesting to start looking at different metrics like that. Like Flag and Flight is directly correlating like how good is your code, basically. Um, and I think that's something I'll probably add back in the future, potentially, or something like that. Because I would love to get a different uh, metric on how good a piece of code is um, from those arbitrary judgments. Um, and then look to see if that has correlation to you know, popular projects or anything like that. Um, but definitely send a pull request or something like that. So. Is that it? Any more questions? Okay, so let's give Zach a big hand. <laughs> <laughs>